yearning to play a few rounds of Gwent. That ought to set me straight. Welcome to Commander's Horn, episode 101. 100 more episodes to go until episode 200. Can you believe it? We've got a great episode for you. CD Projekt Red, Seb McBride, level designer on Thronebreaker is joining me, as well as some of the commandos talking to me about how they've enjoyed Commander's Horn over the last 100 episodes on this episode of Commander's Horn. It is December 1st, 2018. Wow, December 1st. A year ago it was Challenger 2. That's hard to believe. A year ago it was Challenger 2. But it's even harder to believe that we have 100 episodes of Commander's Horn behind us. So we're going to talk a little bit about that with you, the Commandos, as well as have a great interview with CD Projekt Red, Seb McBride, also known as CDPR Moonlight. We talked about the creation of Thronebreaker on many very, very basic levels and very broad strokes as well, as well as the reception of the game and how it was to work through the transition to Gwent Homecoming and uh, an entire engine rebuild. And of course, I have some messages from you as well. The Commandos who wrote in uh, for for the episode 100 special, which wasn't quite what I had hoped it would be as my stream was unable to stay live. I ended up crashing. I did the interview offline and ultimately only the interview went live for the episode. So wasn't quite what I hoped for. A little bittersweet, but we're going to press on and I have a great episode with you guys and with Seb coming up so we can enjoy that. Uh, as I'm sure uh, you will all enjoy that. But let's talk about a couple of things that are that's going on. We're going to enjoy that as you are going to enjoy that. I'm going to leave that part in. Uh, Commander's Horn Podcast at gmail.com. You can send us an email anytime. Tweet at us at Commander's Horn. Find all episodes uh, on YouTube, on a playlist that I keep updated at on my YouTube channel. And of course, we do lots of these live on Thursday on Twitch, twitch.tv slash McBearded, where you can find all of my content and streaming, which is not just playing Gwent, but also drawing Gwent cards. Yes, yes, I am branching out in my content, my friends. So let's talk about a couple of things that happened in the Gwent world, and we'll talk to you guys as well. And also, we have a great interview on this episode. First of all, uh, I'll get the news out of the way. I was part of a really cool a, a streamer tournament. It was the first of its kind. It was uh, it was rounded up and uh, planned and um, scheduled by CD Projekt Red. Uh, it was uh, something that uh, I believe I believe it was something that uh, head of esports Vlad. Uh, Tortsad was uh, spearheading this. And it was a really cool thing. It was very exciting. It was eight streamers from all around the world got a chance to compete against each other for cash and prizes. Well, cash and the prize of winning, of course, which is always the ultimate prize, isn't it? The capital W. Um, McBeard did not get the capital W, but McBeard was definitely in it representing Canada, representing the U.S., Sir Pumpkin, representing South Africa, Miss Lady J., Representing Korea, Maska. Representing Belarus was Nod. Uh, representing Great Britain was Crokies. And representing Poland was Broza. And I've just been guessing on how to pronounce that, but I think that's right. And I also hope that I, d- I didn't just name seven people and completely gloss over somebody else who was part of it. So, But the beauty of recording this and then posting it later means that I can actually interject here and say, duh, I did forget Ash Lizzle from the Netherlands because... Of course, I would forget the one who might actually end up winning the most (laughs) and might actually end up being number one here. So, yes, Ash Lizzle from Netherlands is number eight. Uh, It's always like one of the most important people that I forget when it comes down to these things, because I always make an effort to put in my mind the names that I don't recognize right away, like Masca. Anyway, my group was Miss Lady J, Crokies and Broja. And uh, so that was so this Monday that just went by on the 26th of November, uh, I started off my day taking on Crokies. It was a little, it was a little rough, I think, for both of us. I ended up coming out on top 2-0, which was really great. And then later in the afternoon, I felt like I was a little bit sharper at that point. I took on Miss Lady Jane. It was really intense. I, I, um, you know, I went in, I, I went in confident with, uh, with a Skellige list that uh, not only was she very familiar with it as she came into my chat later on in the week um, when I was playing it and also drawing pictures for Gwent. I'll talk about that in a second, but. 
Uh, she came into the chat and asked uh, if I was playing a deck that she had been playing a ton of on stream. Uh, when I, in fact, I was playing something that uh, was shown to me by Alessio1996, aka Ultraman. Um, but there's anyway, there's a lot of really scary Skellige lists going out there. I think we can just safely say that. And I didn't do too well in that first game, but then the rest of that series. Well, it was really, really cool. And you can check all these uh, series out on uh, my YouTube channel. That would be, of course, uh, youtube.com slash C slash McBeard. But I also think I'm still available at like user slash Gamebot or something like that. So lots of ways you can find uh, my content on YouTube, of course, with Gwent. And then my, uh, my series against Rojo was uh, not as great, I would say. I would say that I misplayed most of that series. Um, but all in all, I did pretty well. By racking up uh, four wins, uh, I think I secured 500 USD. I think Broja, I'm at, there's a tiebreaker match right now. I think Ash Lizzle is going on to try to get like the official winner, like the like the cash prize winner um, for the whole thing. So there's still stuff actually happening uh, as of just like late, like this morning. So it's not totally wrapped up yet, but I had a great time with it. Again, you can find my matches on YouTube. So Gwen Skirmish, that was a big thing that happened. And the other thing that happened was uh, in the last week was the Commander's Horn had its 100th episode, but it didn't go very well. It, uh, I mean, obviously the episode itself was fantastic. Jason Slama gave me a fantastic interview, but I had a hard time staying live. I couldn't stay live. And then we released the episode and I didn't get a chance to actually catch up with the Commandos and actually talk with you about how things uh, you know, people sent me their messages, uh, some of their voice recordings, some emails as well. So I wanted to uh, go over some of those with you. And uh, I'm actually going to be reading them for the first time right here on camera. And um, I do regret not making this a live episode, but we're going to push forward, of course. 102 won't be far from now. And, it, and episode 102 will be right after the patch. Now, I will say something. I don't really like the fact that the patch is coming on this Tuesday, December 4th, and I have no idea what's coming. Like, not really. Like, a couple of leaks here and there on the CDPR forums, but no official word. We don't know what's happening. What is it? It's uh, less than a business day away. I'm not, not really sure how the game's going to look. Um, I have, you know, I'm I'm willing to believe that it had, probably has something to do with um, not wanting to finalize anything until the last possible moment because things are always changing. Uh, and you don't want to miss anything, I guess, because then that could be the next standout sharp edge of the balance scale, you could say. So I suppose that there is that, but, uh, you know, it'd be nice just to hear a little something. I think it'd be nice to hear a little something. So there's that. But I wanted to hear a little stuff from you as well. So I am now going to be reading through um, a couple of things that you have sent me. And then we'll get into a great interview with uh, with Seb McBride. All right, Commandos. Commandos! Here comes our first message here from Professor Murdoch. Perhaps you know him. Perhaps you know him from his previous alias, Death Monkey 1984, I think it was. But he's Professor Murdoch. I met him twice at the Wild Hunt uh, Philadelphia. And this is, a, this is uh, his video message here, which uh, I am now going to take in with you all. So thanks so much, Professor Murdoch, for sending this over my way. Hey, McB. Hey, Commander's Horn. Professor Murdoch here. Just wanted to say a quick thank you to McB and the commander's horn community for one the fantastic content two mcbeard's great personality and positivity that he shared throughout the last year or more and all the great community that we've got i love you guys i love all well okay so when he sent me the message when he sent me the message he said that the that the last little bit got cut off but the main sentiment came through but it's it's pretty clear he he uh and professor murdoch is someone who hangs out in the stream a lot hangs out in the discord a lot and uh he just wanted to give a shout out to all of you because you know he's talking to you guys now you know he knows you know who he is he knows who you are he's shouting out the community and uh yeah a pillar of the commander's horn community thanks so much so much, Professor Murdoch, for sending this awesome uh, bit in. Uh, and now let's uh, let's read some emails. All right, we got a great email here from Matt Juca, who actually gave me a pronunciation guide for his last name. Thank you so much, and I am very familiar with your name. This guy's a frequent redditor as well, and uh, he's on Twitter all the time as well. Uh, so this is Matt Juca he's saying, "Hey McBeard, I started Gwent in the final week of closed beta. Watched Challenger number one and got fully hooked. I had to start listening to a weekly podcast and found the Horn, which would have been around episode forty at the time. Forty episodes in at Challenger one. Haven't missed an episode since. Thanks 
Uh, thanks for all your work on the podcast, the Casting Desk Streaming, and for sticking with Went through the good and bad times. You truly are the voice of the game. Congrats on 100 episodes, and good luck in Gwen Skirmish. Hashtag Commandos. Matt Juka. Commandos! Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. Yeah, Challenger. I was just, you said it was around episode 40, so 40 episodes kind of equates to 40 weeks, uh, give or take a few maybe for a t- for time off, but uh, 40 weeks is uh, almost just shy of a year. And we were already almost a year in when you can think about it like that when Challenger 1 started. There's just so much that has happened with this game. It has met it has gone through such a metamorphosis since then. And I'm and I'm seeing a lot of those things in emails and in chats and in Twitch and in YouTube comments as well. A lot of people kind of reflecting on how the game has changed and what it means to them. Um, I would love to know because as this time goes, as time marches on here and we get towards December 4th, which is going to be our big patch day. Um, the patch that we've been waiting for, this first balancing pass. Um, very excited to know um, how the game's going to feel. And also, I want to know how you guys feel about... I think a lot of people thought there's a lot of potential in the game now. We've gotten used to the passing. We've gotten used to uh, card draw. I just uh, responded to an email from uh, Chris Barter, who... Uh, who, who uh, it, was a, it, was a late, it was a late response, Chris. Uh, and you're going to get it in your inbox. But he was talking about how card draw definitely didn't feel the same but it was an older email it was uh it was from you know just you know a few more weeks have gone by since then and uh like three weeks since then and i know that tastes can keep changing if you can keep playing so i'd love to know what all of you are thinking commanders horn podcast at gmail.com you can always let us know how you're feeling be a part of the show and uh, i have a couple more messages to read for the 100th episode. This last message comes from Mike M. I discovered Gwent just a couple of months ago, right before the last Gwent Open. So that is, a, that is an interesting time to get into the game, by the way. He continues, I loved it immediately. Your enthusiasm and positivity has ha- have helped keep me engaged and excited for Homecoming to be released on console, which is coming up. It's great that you can continue to have fun with the game, even though it goes through its growing pains. Thanks. Growing pains is a great term for it because I think that we, a lot of people that are sticking with the game right now know kind of like at least this new, this new foundation, um, this new foundation of the game, the fundamentals, the gameplay, and what we can expect from balancing, what we can expect from recruit cost changes affecting the way we build and play, what a what a strong deck feels like. Does it feel strong because it just has too many good cards in it? Or does it feel strong because mechanically it has something that's just really, really good? So, you know, on one end you can say, you know, some of the Skellige Croc on Crate decks right now feel so good because you can fit so many strong cards in them because of the budget of some of these cards. Like Wild Boar of the Sea, um, the Spears really work very, very well with Croc with his own ability, of course, as well. But he's able to fit in, you know, you get the, the Unicorn Chironax duo and stuff like that. And when you can start to fit in cards like that with Luxury as well as Witchers and Roach and, and things like that, Croc having like a million mulligans doesn't hurt either. You start to think, hmm, is it a pricing issue? Or when you look at Squiatel and it's just the sheer amount of on-deploy uh, removal and all the thresholds that they can easily meet with all of their leaders having, uh, or at least two of their leaders having ways of actually uh, increasing reach in Bruver and Ethna, and that's probably not going to change in December. But I think that, uh, so it's more like a fundamental standpoint of Scoia'tael is concerning because control is so good, right? And Scoia'tael is so good with it. Whereas Skellige might just be, ah, we might just have to make some of these cards more expensive, and then that, that, the power level of that deck goes down. So very interested to see how this goes. And those are the growing pains that uh, Mike M is talking about. He's talking about we're waiting for things to stabilize. But in the meantime, we're also countering the very strong things. So we're finding new strong things. A lot of people think that Aridin right now is one of the strongest decks in the game. Woodland Spirit still being touted as tier zero number one in the game. But I mean, I've played some variations of Aridin. And his ability is it's strong obviously on an engine or something you want to protect but uh, well obviously sorry what i mean to say it's strong in protecting like a very specific like engine type unit but just putting something out of reach like siri can be pretty wild with aridin that immunity is not to be laughed at when you put it when you put something immune on the board the only way to deal with it is by removing it and you know you can't line up scorches if there's a big immune unit on the board there's just a lot of stuff that aridin can really get away with on the level so I mean, Woodland's good, don't get me wrong. But there's still some growing pain. So 
I'm really looking forward to this big balancing patch that's coming in, but that's not the only thing that's coming in. There is more, of course. If you are a fan of Thronebreaker, and I am, I'm still not finished it yet, but I am working on it. Um, we are about a uh, third of the way through the third act, if you're following me on Twitch, and uh, about halfway through the second act, if you're following me on YouTube, but it's all gonna be catching up very, very soon. But I got a chance to sit down with Seb McBride from CD Projekt Red, level designer for Thronebreaker. The big patch is coming in uh, for Gwen, but it's also going to come in to adjust the difficulty of Thronebreaker as well, because the game is brilliant, but the difficulty is kind of a, kind of sticks out a little bit when you're when you're when you're criticizing I, the game, I guess. So there's going to be a tweak to that, which is great because people who are playing on console for the first time may have a completely different experience as they approach it through hard mode coming in as Gwen veterans. You know, I don't need my handheld, and then they maybe encounter some really, really tough tough puzzles and some tough decision making in this new difficulty that you know doesn't have a uh, you know the washed away feeling of some of the easier fights prior to this patch so we're talking about throne breaker so why not get into the interview with uh, my friend seb mcbride aka cdpr moonlight who i talked to a few weeks ago um you're gonna hear that we're talking a lot about episode 100 we're also talking about how um, my conversation with seb mcbride will be coming before my interview with Jason Salama, which is the opposite of what happened. Structurally, I originally planned on having a back-to-back -back CD Projekt Red interview showcase for episode 100, but my interview with Seb ended up being, you know, almost a solid hour, and then Jason wanted to do something live. So it just kind of changed the way I structured it, but that's why it sounds like that. So if you can forgive a few sentences being out of time, then you should enjoy this great interview with my friend, Seb McBride, CDPR Moonlight. Thanks so much, Seb, and I'll see you all on the next episode of Command is I'm not sinking my time into Thronebreaker. I'm playing it like very deliberately for like YouTube yeah, and yeah. stuff. So like, but I'm reacting to it very, very uh, on time. So yeah, uh, you no, can see how um, I feel about some of that stuff. No, YouTube. no, I've been, I've been watching a bit of it, mate. To be fair, um, we've kind of just like over the last well, few weeks and that. I know everyone in the studio has been kind of watching bits and bats. Um, yeah, cool. No, it's definitely cool. You know, obviously, it's, it's cool to watch people play. Um, yeah, how are you finding it? Uh, I'm I'm finding it, and we can we can start the interview if you if you want as well. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, all right, sure. We, I mean, like we've been talking, so uh, yeah. it's it's fine if it's casual because you know you you are asking me how how Thronebreaker is, and we're obviously going to be talking about Thronebreaker. Yeah. Um, but um, what's the deal with swearing on this? Oh, you can swear. I think I don't okay, think anybody right. cares. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, don't feel bad if uh, I slip up. That's awesome. No, you can swear. I uh, I think I I like <laughs> deliberately swore on the last couple of one. Ones. Let's make it PG thirteen, right? You can swear once. That's yeah. the that's yeah. the thing. Um, yeah, but I like it. I've been liking it a lot, actually. The more I play, cool. uh, I think that the story, like the maps, really everything, everything outside of like what I expected, because like I expected card games, right? I expected mm -hmm. the puzzles and the like the um, the Mahaka Mail Festival and the Salvine and that kind of stuff um, prepared me for the kinds of puzzles that I might encounter. But yeah, what yeah. I wasn't prepared for was um, the depth of the I guess the the shell in which the game was presented, these card games, which could be just as easy as kind of like how the tutorial is now, like a map that just sends you to the to the fights and tells the story that way. Actually being yeah. able to move around the map and the point and click, like kind of like old school sort of like RTS point and click movement styles and um, well, I guess MOBAs uh, also do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the looting and the decision making and the story, it's just so much more than I expected. And uh yeah, it was just a huge. The, the project scope was very, very clear as soon as I started walking around myself. Yeah, it, it kind of was. Uh, I'm glad to hear that because that was kind of one of the things that, when obviously marketing get get their hands on it, mm -hmm. they just want to they want they want to make a big deal, right? So they kind of show a lot, and it's like every time I saw something from them, it's like, oh no, I don't want to show that yet. Um, yeah, but they have they have to, you know, you know. So. It's like the trailer for comedies, right? It's like yeah. you put you put your funniest line in the in the trailer, mm -hmm. and then you watch the trailer like a hundred times, and you're not even psyched about that joke anymore. Yeah. And then yeah. you realize the movie wasn't very funny. But that's not what happened with Thronebreaker. I still think that <laughs> there are a lot of things that I go into. It's usually like the stuff that's really interesting. I think is like the mid scene, 
the mid scene um, stories that are told in like just the like the black and white, mm-hmm. where you get the sound effects and like there's a specific act to. Uh, moment that we're not going to get too spoilery, but uh, we are going to probably talk about early act stuff. But there's some mid act two stuff where you see the image; it's a gruesome Im- image, and you can hear the screaming. But the rest of it is kind of just in the narration and kind of in your head, because yeah. the map only gives you so much to go on. And then as you go through the special events, it's like this is what's really like being seen. This is the scale of what's happening right now. I just well, think that thing, that was done really well. The thing I love about it is it actually harkens back to like I know a lot of people have talked about it in regards to like um it, whenever I used to like read the uh, choose your own adventure books mm. when I was a kid yeah like it was all I mean you like I literally cheated and had like all five hand fingers in the different choices so I could oh, quickly skip back um, that is that is <laughs> sacrilege yeah but no like it was very much kind of that impression of like you just get shown an image. And then it's it's kind of you have to use your imagination, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I think a lot of games nowadays kind of just like here's really cool things that you get to see and um, all these visual and all this money that we spent on these visuals. Um, but it's it's a really nice way of kind of making players use their imagination to like you hear the audio mm-hmm. and you just go like you get the reference image and then you can kind of figure out what's going on. I think it's really really cool. Yeah, I mean, coming from, I mean, you're on a podcast right now, and a podcast is all about the magic of radio. <laughs> so, <laughs> on the internet at the same time, as you yeah. are also on a video for the podcast. But, you know, being able to combine sort of like, there's so many visuals that are combined in Thronebreaker as well. The comic book visuals, the uh, the very specific art style and the conversation pieces, the very specific art style and the overview and the map. Um, as well as the actual card games themselves, which themselves also have different flavors if it's a puzzle or if it's an actual mm-hmm. battle. Sometimes there are cutscenes within the card games. Sometimes the card games are very, very different from any other one, like the Manticore uh, preview fight or, uh, well, the fight, I guess, at this point. We've all played it. So, like, things yeah. like that, I find it's just such a blend of all sorts of things. And there really isn't a card game. There isn't a game, period, out there like it. So I think that the the reviews were were pretty telling. I think a lot of people were impressed. Like, where did this thing come from, this Great Witcher game? Yeah. I remember you, uh, you tweeted on review day when the embargo went off. Um, for the reviews, you tweeted you were out. You were out having drinks with people. That was a big day, I imagine, when you finally got those reviews pouring in. Yeah, no, that was super cool. I mean, <laughs> funnily enough, I was like really ill. Actually, Ooh. when we like, I think it was like the day we basically finished. It's like, okay, right, we're done now. Not nothing else is being mm. changed. Um, I mean, it's probably later than that. Actually, it was very close to release or very up to up, near the release. It would have been um, yeah, three days I think until release yeah. at that point. Um, yeah, and it was just a, like my I think it was like I took holidays that week, mm-hmm. um, and like as soon as I got to the end of the day, I was like. Oh no, no, I, I feel a bit ill now. Like just head cold and that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was like maybe a couple of days later, and it was just like, oh man, I feel so rough. Um, but I was going out anyway, right? Yeah, of course, big days. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. You got to do that. So let's back up for a little bit for the people who are listening and for the people who are watching. Um, I have you on the screen as Moonlight, as you are mm-hmm. in uh, on Twitch. You're known as Moonlight, and uh, you. You you have the moniker Moonlight a lot, but you're also you're also known as Darth Sebius. So yes. Um, <laughs> one of those two names you could be known by but I, I i chose moonlight for the video here but um but where are you from because you're not polish so where are you from mm-hmm. and uh how long have you worked at cdpr uh okay so yeah i'm from uh manchester well just outside of manchester mm-hmm. in uh in the uk in england um a little town called shaw mm-hmm. um and i joined cdpr beginning of last year so like january last year um Okay. And I, yeah, I literally came over for for Thronebreaker, um, January of last year. Yeah, so it'll be 2017. Okay, so that's been almost two years at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, two years. Yeah. Now, does that mean you've been working on Thronebreaker since the very beginning, or was the project in progress when you started? Uh, it like it had started, mm-hmm. um, but it was very much kind of not in its infancy, but um. Because Nilfgaard was just put into Gwent around that time, I believe. So it was still yeah, I think like, it was like April. It was only like when they got put in. three or four months after closed beta actually got started. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, like when I um, kind of applied. So like I, I've been working at a different a different studio in Manchester. It was like an indie studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and they closed. So, 
took a few months off and basically, oh, okay, weigh my options up. Where do I want to go? Um, kind of mm-hmm. just sent a lot of invites out. Um, and this was kind of one of those where it's like, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. Um, they're obviously a very, very good studio, so mm-hmm. I was kind of right. weighing up. And then I got response back and did the test, did the interviews, um, and then, yeah, got the, uh, got the job. And it was kind of like, it's a weird one for anyone, like any of the viewers that have ever kind of moved country. Um, it's always kind of a, well, I always get, I always was told that it was like a daunting thing mm-hmm. to, to move country. But I mean, for me, when I got here, it was either a case of, I'm going to love it over here. I'm going to hate it and go back. Right. And within like two days of being here, it was like, Warsaw is amazing. Like Warsaw is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. I have enjoyed myself so. every time I've been there. And uh, probably mainly because the the weather is almost exactly the same as it is in Toronto, mm-hmm. where I'm from. So, um, but yeah, Warsaw. I mean, what was the first thing that struck you about Warsaw when you when you moved? I mean, when I first got here, mm-hmm. uh, one of our HR uh, ladies that welcomed me at the airport, she actually messaged me um, before I got on the flight to Warsaw, mm-hmm. and she's like, "You need to put a coat on. Like, I get a really warm coat." I was like, "Oh no, no, I'll be fine," you know. And she's like, "No, no, it's really cold. It's like winter." Now. <laughs> um, and that was the moment when I got off the plane and I actually walked outside. I was like, oh, no, this is actually, you know, because I'm from Manchester and it rains all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, we occasionally have a season, maybe. <laughs> um, but majority of the time it's raining. Um, so I was like, no, I got here and I was like, oh, no, this is actually a winter where, you know, if it's not, if you stay outside, you'll get cold. It's like, if you stay outside long enough, you'll probably die. Yeah, it's um, pretty, it gets pretty cold in the dead of winter, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you're from Canada, right? So I guess you're kind of used to this. But. Yeah, the weather is really similar. I remember uh, I remember one of the times Merchant was over, Merchant said that he, Poland forced him to get a coat also from England. Yeah. So it's possible. Yeah. It's possible he's coming from the same from the same point. Um, yeah. So Thronebreaker was in its infancy. Um, and I guess as it started to develop, um, I guess, well, I just like, I, as like each time, can you tell me about a time where you felt like it became a bigger project? Because I'm sure that the initial concept of a card game that would be single player didn't mm-hmm. involve like the scope of what we finally got in Thronebreaker, which stands very tall as its own game, I, 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 like by itself, um, just with like the sprawling maps and the amount of dialogue and the amount of thought that's gone into everything. Mm-hmm. At what point, yeah, I mean, like, tell me about like the points in time or maybe any a very specific point in time where you realize, wow, the scope of this is really getting a lot larger than, than we had thought. And was that was that exciting at the time? Yeah, I mean, so like, well, I, and there's a couple of different times, actually. There's, there's a couple of different times um, throughout the development period um, that I was there anyway. But yeah, when I remember when I first got like the first couple of days, and um, when I got there, the, there was already like um, a version of Lyria actually kind of made. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, there was like, I don't know whether any of the viewers have seen the adventure. Like there was like leak footage of the adventure online um, years ago, right? And that was the, the, the little girl story. The little girl, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm very familiar with this with this leak, you could say. Yes. Um which I actually had to hunt down to get a reference for what I was actually working on before, just as a little side note. Mm-hmm. Um, That's where I met. I mean, <laughs> I, the, uh, ooh, I don't know how to say this, but I met you around the same time I heard about that thing. I guess mm-hmm. I could say that that well, was. Well, I mean that. I think that was that was, that leaked, was the... right? it, that was leaked before I started the studio, so it was kind of a known known quantity. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to remember what time that what what uh, what event that was, but that's like E three maybe. I don't know. It was like 2016, okay, okay. 2016. Um, so anyway, yeah. Um, you'll you'll have to bear with me, but I go on tangents for you. No, I want you to. It's the best part of a podcast is just uh, um, organic conversation. But just quickly before I forget, when I met you, do you remember what I what one of the very first things I said to you? I was making a coffee and I asked you for a stir stick. <laughs> You... Oh, the spoon! Yeah, the I spoon. was looking for. I was just looking for a spoon to mix my coffee, but I said stir stick because sometimes we use plastic stir sticks, and I, I didn't. Know. I just didn't even think about saying the word spoon, and then I just that's it. First impressions, right? I never forget that. Oh no, no, I know what you're on about. Yeah, I, oh, the yeah. things you get in coffee shops, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I thought you'd just mistaken a spoon for a, a spoon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> exactly like, how I not, felt at the, the time. Thing at the end on, the, on these things in Canada. I don't know. Uh, um, great stuff. All right, go ahead. Go on your tangent. Tell okay, me. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the, you had the the thing with Geralt, right? Hmm. Um, but then when I got to obviously start working on Thronebreaker, um, 
I, there was an already like a really early version uh, of, of Lyria that um, uh, our narrative um, director lead, I, I don't know, it, basically it's Matthews uh, Tomaskevich, who's the game director now. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like him and uh, Cooper were like the narrative guys. Um, and yeah, he kind of made a, like a really basic version of, of Lyria. Uh, and just for like context, I guess, mm-hmm. um, that was... Um, like the size of Lyria for anyone that's played Thronebreaker, um, this was maybe like I don't know, like a sixteenth of the size or something. It was it was pretty small. Um, yeah, I felt like so Lyria had kind of uh, you can yeah. see how how much they kind of grow. It's grown. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of that, right? Um, so I mean, I remember talking to him and going, "Hey, you know, um, we might need to make this a bit bigger, um, just for obvious reasons. Well, some reasons, um, some narrative, and I mean, there was a bit. I don't know, it was." He didn't. Ta- I'm not gonna say he didn't take much convincing, but I was like, you know, I think I think we need to make this a bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like, oh, all right, cool. Um, and I remember kind of planning out the an- the analytics or the, the the metrics for the level. Mm-hmm. And it's like, all right, well, we got the times from like point A to point B to point C, and like the the estimated times of the battles that are gonna take place. Um, and then it was the, kind of that point was like, oh, all right, well, we even if we just times this by how many maps we have. Um, okay, we've got a substantial kind of amount of content here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I mean, that was just kind of me in the early stages of just kind of messing with the map. Um, and I know like some of the designers got involved in regards to the battles and that. Um, and you, you know, people just kind around. of wanted... when you say messing around, you mean I say messing around, I mean like just kind of early blockouts, yeah, um, yeah. like yeah, early layouts of, of kind of had the shape of every, every level. Mm-hmm. Um, and that they change over time, right? I think uh, it's one of the later levels that that changed quite a few times, um, just to get the um, goal that we were trying to go for, right? Mm-hmm. Um, development's an iterative uh, process, um, but yeah, once like other people, like the designers, um, in the battles and that got involved, and, and we kind of we got to a point. It's like, all right, well, we, now we need some more stuff. Um, you know, we kind of had time to do that, but yeah, it was. Um, I mean, the game was meant to come out like what was it, October, November last year, I think. The original um, idea was yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, we kind of got to the point where it's like, okay, then no, 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 this is probably not coming out. Um, it's not, it's not ready. Um, so yeah, that was kind of that, and then we we pushed it. So yeah, right on. So, um, but that was, it was always in the, uh, it was always in the vein of making it a bigger and more robust game. So, yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. like I think with anything with CDPR, right. It's, we want to make really cool things. And I know pretty much everyone on the studio, well, everyone, I would presume everyone in the studio came to the, to the studio to, to make really, really cool things. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were allowed, we had the benefit to, to do that. Right. Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of cool. It's like, we don't want to just make something that's kind of meh. It's like, no, this has to be really good. Yeah. Um, so. well, I think it exceeded expectations as far as what a single player version of a card game is in that it, I mean, it wasn't, it's just so much more. It's just so, so much more. Um, I mean, I've, I've spent, I've spent at least, I think I'm like eight or nine hours in and I'm still <laughs> like making my way through act two, uh, trying to find all my borders and all my goodies. Um, so it's like there's just a, such a substantial amount of stuff there. Um, so I'm just, you know, I hope I hope as uh, as it comes out for consoles, I hope it has a really good holiday season as well. Mm-hmm. But on your team, like, or I, I say you were on the Thronebreaker team, level design team. Yep. What did what aspect did you spend the most time uh, on working on, or was it was it a lot of different stuff? So I mean, yeah, it was a, it was a few things. Um, so like we basically a lot of like kind of layout stuff, uh, a lot of gray boxing block out white boxing mm. there's different terms for it um yeah. but it's basically the the layout of the environments um it's for all different maps um basic asset population um we we do have environmental artists which did work on it um but yeah it was kind of for the early days early days it was when we got the assets i would kind of populate and uh just like fences houses mm-hmm. you know we had a settlement here. What's it going to look like, right? Yeah. Uh, just to get kind of a feeling of uh, of different locations and like the different biomes in the in the levels. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but like collision work as well that was kind of a big deal normally yeah. that's kind of handled from the the art side in depending on the on the studio because they also um, do map like it's i mean this is like this is nitty-gritty game design stuff like this is uh, sure i mean yeah it, it depends on the studio right um sometimes the design do it sometimes art does it um hmm. but yeah the um because of that kind of type of the game type of game that we have um we kind of had different versions of collision on mm -hmm. the assets and, and obviously on the terrain so collision was kind of something that i dealt with um so i could leave the artist to just kind of make the thing mm -hmm. really pretty um which i did a pretty good job of i must say yeah i mean um, she, she's definitely meve is definitely not running into rivers and on top of houses so <laughs> yeah i'm, I'm glad Fantastic. to see that <laughs> i'm glad to see no one's uh, no one's broken it yet um but no it was like yeah so that um setting up event triggers um so that our narrative guys would would set the the flow chart blueprints um scripts mm. up for these events and then i'd hook them up on the levels um basic cameras like we put cameras like the camera zooms in and out and stuff like that yeah there's some um, really great moments where you get to see like a bunch of landscape or mm -hmm. um like a siege that's happening at any given time um like I feel like that that that's done very well as well. Yeah, I mean that was kind of just like me placing them then, and, mm -hmm. and then we got one of the uh, the other guys to to actually make it look better. Uh, <laughs> should we say? Um, what else did I do? Loot placement was kind of one of my things as well. Okay. Um, so you hit all the chests for us. Yeah, the chests were actually yes, they were definitely me. Um, cool. Well, the the ones in the level, the ones that you dig up, were actually. Um, done by another designer um but the ones that you can see on the map ah okay um, they were they were placed by me because they kind of tied into the actual environment of i think there's one in the first level near the castle where you can see it but you can't really get to it right yeah and then maybe another one where you can if you go and collect some loot you can see it just off to the side and that's kind of the the effect that i wanted with that was that you could see it in the corner it's like, oh that's really cool what's that shiny thing oh, i need yeah. to go and find that and then when you get it, you go, like, oh, I remember, I remember where I was. Um, so that was kind of the deal with them things. Um, but yeah, that was kind of it. Like a lot of, a lot of like kind of layout stuff. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much. Right on. Um, so did you work on puzzles in game, car like the actual in game card game stuff? Like that seems like it seems like a very uh, separate thing. I mean, just like the the art in the game, the art on the cards, the the realistic like war torn battlefield of 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 the homecoming update. Um, it seems like it's a very like separate module to the game. Is that true? Did you and did you work on any of that stuff, or were you mostly making sure that the the single player, like the experience of actually traversing the map, was was more uh, was that more your thing there? Yeah, that that was more my thing. Mm -hmm. um, no, the battles and um, like the, the the art and the actual in game kind of in Gwent mm -hmm. game part. No, I didn't do much of that. So, I didn't so, do any of that. To be fair, but like there was uh, so one of our designers, David. Um, he did uh, a lot of heavy lifting on the puzzles, um, and I'm glad that he's getting a lot of praise. I mean, the other designers did puzzles mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, th I'm glad that the, the, the reception for the puzzles seems to be overwhelmingly positive. Um, so that's good. I'm, I'm glad of that. I got stumped uh, on one last time I played <laughs> the she troll one with the lightning rod. I got, Ooh, man. It, I think it, like I did something right, right away. And then I immediately discounted that as a possible thing that worked. So then I tried like 20 more times doing it a different way, but the first yeah. way was right. I don't know. That was a really good one. That one really stumped me. I mean, the, uh, the, um, the, so they, obviously David implemented all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, but me and him, like, I remember there was a meeting we had where is like, we had the list of all the, all the puzzles mm -hmm. that we wanted to put in. And, uh, it was literally just me going through and, and trying to get as many pop culture references in as possible. Or giving him as many ideas as possible. Okay. I was like, okay, so we've got the. Um, I don't know whether you're there yet, but there's one with like a, a pile of corpses, right? So it was like, oh, we need. No, actually, I tell a lie. It's not that. It's um, it, it is in the second level, but there's like a there's like a little house you find with a the puzzle there, and there's like I think it's Neckers or uh, rot fiends that are moving towards your side of the board. Okay. This was actually something similar was done in the um, Halloween event last year. Um, yeah the vampires that are coming towards you that one yeah, was uh it was that's a reference from uh that was what i wanted a reference for night of the living dead of oh the nice moving towards the, the house yeah yeah um so it's just little things like that right it's like i oh, don't know it'd be really cool if we could do this this and this uh mm. and he's like, oh yeah and then he kind of think about it um from his side of like how do i implement this um 
And it was just like they just give him that spark. Um, so I'm not going to take too much credit because he obviously did a lot of the heavy lifting. But I like to feel that I had some kind of even just a small influence and that was kind of cool. Well, people say people have been saying in my chat when I play that there are Easter eggs all over the place, like stuff, yes, like references yes. and callbacks. Um, and I'm trying placement to remember. Placement of them was me. Hmm? So, placement, the placement of, of those were you? Me. Okay. So what would you um, what would you say was the most challenging thing to design in Thronebreaker? Um, I mean, for the team, maybe, or for yourself personally. I mean, for me personally, um, it's 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 a game set in the Witcher universe, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and this was one of the big things that kind of drew me to the project. Is hey, we're doing another single player in the Witcher universe, and you know, people fans are, are very kind of protective over the um their interests and mm-hmm. the the games they really like and the lore and the stories. And the history that that has, and especially over here with The Witcher, um, mm-hmm. it's it's a big deal. I didn't realize how big of a deal it actually is, but like they read the books in school, man. You know what I mean? It's like we read Shakespeare back in the UK. Yeah. When we're growing up, they, they read um, the books. So When's the next Shakespeare game coming out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm surprised no one's ever done one. That'd be great. Um, well, all the different plays that he did. Oh, um, but, there's, a, there's a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like kind of delving in and making areas that have been mentioned before mm-hmm. uh, in the games and in the books. So then I just have to go and build them and lay them out and go, all right, well, you know, how do I manage expectations of what people like think of these areas, mm-hmm. right? Because everyone kind of is going to have their own impression or own idea of what these places will look like. Um, so it's just kind of taking reference. But yeah, definitely like the, the levels were, yeah, how to make them um witcher I don't, right I yeah i guess true that, to the yeah. brand um, right yeah definitely like yeah. how not how to how to make them without disappointing people mm-hmm. i think that was kind of the the because i like when on something like this you, there's like two trains of thought you can either you've got to be respectful of the of the um the property the ip yeah. um and what and the fans as well um but on the other hand you can't think too much about that because if you start thinking about that too much, you'll you'll just cripple under the pressure of of doubt, right? It's like, oh well, can I can I do this? Can I not do this? Can I, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so you kind of have to have your own um, vision, and and the team obviously has a vision. And I have a, a boss as well who you know kind of feeds into that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of picking from both of them of like, oh okay, I I have my idea of what one of the levels is going to look like, um, and take influence. So yeah, kind of figuring them levels out. Like mm-hmm. I said before, the uh, I think one of the levels we did, it got reworked uh, a, a couple of times, um, simply because it just wasn't quite right. I mean, these aren't massive changes, but mm-hmm. yeah, definitely takes a bit of work. And uh, and what was your favorite? Uh, you can just give me the number because I I actually you know I'm still getting through the game myself. But what was your favorite act design wise? Um, from a map standpoint, yeah, I. Th- I don't know. I like them all, to be fair. I'm kind of biased on that one. Um, I mean, I've liked the I, two that I've seen so far. I do like Eden, mm-hmm. which is obviously the, the um, spoilers. It's the map you're on. Yes, uh, that's the one. But I, I mean, I think every level kind of brings something to the table in mm-hmm. regards to visual, um, like the visual aspects, and then obviously the narrative and even the layout. Like There are certain things that we did in some levels that we don't do in other ones to kind of catch not to catch the player out but like kind of surprise them mm-hmm. uh, some levels are more linear than than others and that again was done for a, a very valid reason you know because of the, the environments and yeah. that seems like there's like a like large areas that kind of funnel into the main objective and then you bloom out into like uh, that's kind of like how the beginning of edern felt specifically yeah. Um, just going through the bottom part and then you get to the first main event and then you're in the woods, which is what I'm just clearing right now. Well, um, it was like kind of with, um, with Lyria, it, it is pretty straightforward. Like we mm-hmm. get, we get to a point and then it kind of branches off and you, you can, if you want, go mm-hmm. and explore. Um, but then it kind of brings you back, um, to obviously the choke point where the, the, the story, the narrative story beats are, mm-hmm. um, but linear, uh, Lyria is kind of pretty linear and that was very much done for a reason because it is the first level, right? Yeah. So you don't want to. You don't want to over complicate things for for players coming in, um, and then in the second level we kind of open things up with the forest a bit more. Um, 
and trying to kind of throw maybe a bit of confusion in there so maybe people feel a bit lost um but not too lost you know yeah it's, it, it's a big game but it's not that big of a game um, it's big yeah it's big like we said like uh, expectations wise it seems it seems huge it seems like wow all this stuff and I think that a lot of the Gwent stuff, you know, uh, between the achievements and reward system, there's a lot of stuff that was kind of shown to us right before the release. It kind of brought a lot of stuff into scope, like, wow, there's a lot of stuff here, considering, yeah. you know, we weren't even sure if uh, if Homecoming would uh, come out in October. And now not only is it, and all this new stuff is coming up, but Thronebreaker is bigger and, like, much more different than we thought. And I feel like, because Lyria is where we saw all the previews from Lyria, um, like, you know, when the, when the embargo was up, we saw IGN's preview video and that was a big day. I watched those videos all day long, like live on stream and yeah. act one and like the first like tutorial stuff, like all that stuff sets expectations for any game. Um, but during that pre-release week when the reviewers were playing and allowed to express their hands on and talk about it and even play with some of the people from CDPR, do you feel that that early act and the, that those early reviews did a good job of presenting the game? Um, I mean... From like the preview standpoint, yeah, I think so. Or Act One yeah, in general, I mean, do you feel like like think... setting setting Meve on that route, um, as far as like what happens at the end of Act One towards the end of Act Two, and how uh, the decisions you make, you're from a you're in a position of power, but maybe that power mm -hmm. is you know not not going to last for the entire game. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. it was. It, I think I think definitely. Um, I mean, the, there was a couple of different things. Well, there's a few different things that we had to do for mm -hmm. Lyria. Um, namely it you have to kind of set the story up with with queen meave um and for the first like third of the map he like nilf got a, a, a spoilers again mm -hmm. for an, if you've not played this go play it yeah um, it's light right. act one spoilers i'll make sure everybody's yeah. protected <laughs> cool um but yeah like nilf gotta know what to be seen um uh, and it's all about the bandits right mm -hmm. it's all about the strays of spoiler um and that was kind of it was very intentional from a from a narrative standpoint you know uh kuba um and Matty very much focused on the strays. Mm -hmm. Um from from my side, like Lyria is when you first start it, it's very kind of I idyllic. It's um it's a really nice place, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for the Witcher universe. I think the only comparison really that we've seen in like games before would be like Tucson. Right. Which is a land untouched by war or, or yeah, not not as right. scarred by war as maybe Velen was yeah. and which I mean like like Toussaint is very much on the surface it's really kind of idyllic mm -hmm. and um and pleasant. But like you have this kind of undercurrent of well, the monsters still and, and that's what it's it's almost um uh it's almost trickery, right? It's mm -hmm. it's kind of leading you to the one thing. Yeah, yeah. Um so Lyria was kind of I think similar to that in regards to like it was it is very much in the witch universe it, it does kind of i think for well, i hope it feels that way to players mm -hmm. um but it is more of a, a pleasant kind of start you know and then we obviously go to the later maps and it gets a bit more witcher-esque um but yeah i think just lyria with it being kind of bright um and not happy but pleasant should we say in some in some regard mm -hmm. People um, are getting married, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's like one of the only nice things that happens. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it's like, it, it's kind of expectations, right? People mm. come into this and, and Thronebreaker is very much its own game. Um, I remember during the Round of Gwent last year, I think it mm -hmm. was. Um, and one of the questions asked is like, I basically responded like, we are taking influence from the Witcher universe, but this isn't the Witcher, right? Mm -hmm. It is set in the same universe, but it is not the Witcher, right? So we got to keep certain things um, laid down by the other games um, and the books to some respect, mm -hmm. um, but we got to kind of make it our own thing, right? So we got to do certain things a certain way. Um, so yeah, that's cool. I think that everybody agrees that Thronebreaker, uh, once they finally saw it, was a very ambitious project. How does it feel to be a part of a, a project that grows and grows like this and then ultimately uh, really surprises people in the end? It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> towards the end. It's yeah, terrifying. towards the end. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's exciting, right? It, it's, we obviously want to make the, the best game we can possibly make. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it... it if, as it's coming up to release, yeah, that's when you start getting a bit of butterflies. Um, but then, yeah, as it comes out, I like. I remember reading. Um, I think it was on Reddit and stuff. People were kind of they were posting um, threads about, oh, you know, 
it's maybe like the thing like the press uh, sorry the marketing was like oh it's like 30 hours long and that people were responding to that of like oh my god it's 30 it's 30 hours long yeah and and obviously because we worked on the game we've known that for, for years right so um to finally be able to marketing's pushing that out and to finally see people's reaction to that mm-hmm. like, that's super exciting it's like oh my god yeah you guys have no idea um you guys absolutely have no idea um but yeah no it, it's super cool I, i'm glad i'm happy with um like kind of my work on it uh, and me kind of having to dip my hand into the witch universe and kind of make like i said before making areas that people have, have heard about but never really been or seen um and mm-hmm. kind of like again i i, I want to quote something that was said in the studio um it was a sure. funny joke but it's it spoils what the third map is well Where we go let's not do that then but okay um i have i, have, I mean I have, I have a feeling i know what the third map is because i'm pretty mm-hmm. sure i know what the fourth map is but yeah um i mean Tell me the it game. was just it. it, it t- no, no, because it, 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 if for anyone that's watched it or hasn't watched it or hasn't played it, sure, it sure. will spoil, spoil okay. the map. Um, that's a shame actually, because that was it was just an off comment of someone said this line, and then I, I basically like, it wasn't. But uh, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm rambling. <laughs> well, <laughs> feel, uh, people are safe from spoilers in that case. A lot of people are still playing through it. I know I still am playing mm. through it. Um, but I want to ask you a question that I feel like I've asked you this before, but not maybe not on the record. Um, mm-hmm. About the Wild Boar card, how did you end up in the Wild Boar art? So I basically had a chat, um, friends with uh, our art director, Kasha mm-hmm. Rudeshuk. Um, yeah, and I basically said to her, hey, Kasha, like, people are getting put in cards. Like, can I, can I get in a card? <laughs> um I, I need i need like a, a legacy piece right i need i need to be i need to be in one of these cards you know i need so, to be remembered <laughs> pat my ego please um and no it, it wasn't that bad it was like Kasha, can i be in a card please mm-hmm. um and i felt guilty about asking actually when i asked her first time i was like hey you know can i be you know, in a card mm-hmm. uh and then she kind of took it away so yeah go away go away no um and then, and then she added you to the list <laughs> i think yeah pretty much yeah pretty much um but yeah, I think I think I might have been off that day. And she messaged me and she's like, "Hey, um, do you want to be in a in a card?" And I was like, "Absolutely." She's like, "As long as it's Skelliger." Uh, and she's like, "Yeah, no, oh, that's now cool. you start making demands." <laughs> yeah, no, so as long as it's Skelliger, right? Um, and she's like, "You know, yeah, it's really cool." And uh, Bogner, um, who did who did the art, she I got in contact with her and she's like, "Oh no, it's really cool. Um, you're like you're like not the main focus. You're in the background." Um, and it has a boar. And I was like, okay. And then I saw the card. I was like, this is amazing. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, this is absolutely fantastic. And I was like, as long as I get to name the pigs, not the piglets, um, or the boar, I don't know what. A you had to name. Boars. Did you name the piglets? Were they in the flavor yeah, text? Uh, it, uh, no, 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 no. This is, I don't even, this is not canon. This is just like. It's not kind canon. Of, when I, not <laughs> canon with your pig lore. Oh, what was it? It was, uh, yeah, Molly, Polly, Tom, Dick, and Harry. There you go. There we are. Excellent. Yeah, so I don't think you'll ever see that in uh, any references or lore, but there we are. Well, the, my, the trivia is going to. In my heart, that's what they're called. <laughs> the trivia comes now from th- this is where you. This is where the Wikipedia source comes from. There On Commander's are. Horn, episode one hundred. <laughs> it is said that the pigs' names. Exactly. Um, and one more thing about names. So we, I talked at the top of the show. You go by Moonlight um mm. a lot uh as far as like in the gaming world or at least on twitch what does moonlight what does that mean to you it's my online persona for my work stuff um oh it's it, for your work stuff okay well i know work stuff i mean just like twitch mm-hmm. uh, and that um and that kind of have it on my twitter but uh, i had it on the reddit as well right and okay i think i have it on the forums as well i don't know i don't post on the forums um but no it was like i don't know online monikers kind of normally have a backstory to them um yeah, sometimes and I, i've been asked this a couple of times it's like, oh so moonlight what does what does it mean why did you pick moonlight it's like dude like when i picked it i was literally looking around the room and the moon was shining and that would that is literally it like there's there's no kind of really random backstory to it it was i literally looked out the window and it was the moon was out i was like ah, oh, that'd be cool it's kind of kind of edgy right so yeah and then, um, and then Moonlight was in Gwent, and it may okay. make a return one time. 
So there we are. It is still Gwenty in its own way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was kind of the thing. I picked the name, and then obviously Moonlight came out as a card. I was like, oh, here we go. There you go. Moonlight All the jokes. All, All the jokes. Joke. <laughs> um, I'm just curious. Um, now, I just I want to talk about you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. What was your favorite game growing up? This is a question I like to ask everybody who comes on the podcast because I like to know where people come from. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, I used to ask people what music they listen to when they're growing up to kind of feel them out as a person, but now it's all mm -hmm. about what games do you play? Because uh, that's where I can at least relate from. So, um, okay, so I mean, I've been gaming for years, right? Yeah. So I'm. 34 now so yeah i've been gaming for a while um growing up i mean my, some of my all-time favorite games like resident evil 2 great down. game great yeah. game um mm -hmm. resident evil nemesis again fantastic game um original starcraft okay okay like that um shooter wise like goldeneye on the 64 like we're going back a bit now no that's um, good i i used to play it too and i like time crisis later on which was like yep. the it seemed like it was the same developers that made it. It had the same right. like HUD. I the used same... to have the uh, the the light gun and the the controller. You could press the controller, but I actually had the home version of it. So yeah, you could say. Oh, sorry, TV. not Time Crisis. Sorry, Time Splitters. Time Splitters. Um, oh, that was uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Time Splitters. That was the one with um, like that, like they had like the the blue bracket on the side for your shields and the red parenthesis thing on the side for your. Like, you had the same achievements at the end. Like it was very much like exactly like Goldeneye, but just like this futuristic thing. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, obviously Perfect Dark came after that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Goldeneye man, like I mean, anyone that's kind of my age who's watching in chat will probably have fond memories of Goldeneye. Um, that game has not aged well at all. No, it it's, hasn't. No, it's not great now. Um, Last time I yeah, saw it, I was but... watching somebody do a speed run of the first level, and I thought, yeah. man, that's a lot of white blurry squares. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, for nostalgia reasons, just memories. Yeah, that, was, that game was absolutely fantastic. Um, what else? Metal Gear Solid. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, that was kind of a big one. Uh, shooter wise, I like recently, um, last ten years, Planet Side Two is kind of a Planet big Side, one. Planet never played um, it. Planet Side Two, free to play, very good game. Um, um yeah, like, hmm. like holy shit, yeah, I put, I put some hours in that. Is, that I think that was like you know when everyone has that game that they put a lot of hours into. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that that one would be mine definitely. Right on. So yeah, I think mine was uh. I played uh, I played a lot of Diablo two back in the day mm -hmm. when I was going uh, to college for the first time. We are actually very we are actually very close in, in age. So when you say stuff like Resident Evil two, like when I was playing Resident Evil two, and I realized that I was going to have to put that second disc in and start the game over again, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is the greatest game ever. Apparently, yeah. I'm only halfway through it. Yeah. It was so 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 that was like such a defining moment of uh, that was like one of the first we're talking about how Thronebreaker exceeds expectations and stuff like that mm -hmm. you know castlevania symphony of the night was another one where it's like i got to do the whole thing upside down now like yep. the same sort of moments where oh i thought i was done i'm not even <laughs> close to done or oh i thought this was going to be it no this is so much more than that it's such a great moment and i feel like as uh, as we get older those moments are lesser and lesser maybe because we have less time to play or i think so i mean yeah. i think i think just with nowadays with with games mm -hmm. um like there's i think there's just not an overabundance because I, I know people that have used that term before it's there's just so much more choice nowadays mm -hmm. you know um and i'm kind of envious of of people growing up who are young teens now who will grow up even more and then they'll have way more choice in the, in the future mm -hmm. um but yeah like, i mean like we were talking about before like Red Dead, it's a fantastic game. You know, Assassin's Creed again, fantastic game. Mm -hmm. Battlefield, it's been playing that. Um, all really, really good games. Um, and it's just, yeah, gaming is is just fantastic now. That the scene and and the amount of choice that people have um, is absolutely fantastic. I would agree. Um, one last question for you um, sure. about Gwent. What is what is your favorite Gwent card except for Wild Boar? Like, what card has always been like, you just, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, and, and the games, the cards have changed so much. So if you have mm -hmm. to say two different cards with a similar effect, we'd all understand. But there's a card for a lot of people where, you know, once they see it, they think, that's the card I want to try, like, building stuff around all the time. Do you have a card like that in uh, in So in, in Homecoming or pre-Homecoming? Any, any, any effect or any, any, I guess, anything, any, uh any mechanic or effect that has always kind of spoken to you so in homecoming 
Um, there is a card. There's a Northern Realms card. Oh, okay. And it is called Fortress Pride. Yes. That card is fantastic when you set it up correctly. It's a fun card. That is a very, very fun card. Um, so you like the yeah. old Ballista as well, I imagine. From yeah, the... I mean, I was always kind of a big... I, I, from a lore perspective, I love Skellige, right? The, yeah. the whole Viking, Irish Viking thing is just awesome. Um, but like from, from a faction standpoint, no, I love Northern Realms. Kind of always have done. Mm-hmm. don't know why I just gravitate towards them, guys. Um, and yeah, so yeah, the, the Northern Realms, like the, the Ballistas, and I mean going back to closed beta stuff like the the towers the siege towers with uh when you use promote oh god that. no I, no yeah. that's, that's like my least favorite it's like my least favorite know. uh previous deck like in the game that was just <laughs> if oh you, you had to have i mean it's it's very similar like in homecoming you know we have the different ping thresholds like three and four and like where your units are safe and from what and at what point but if you didn't have like a four ping to kill the siege towers if you didn't have if you didn't have like stuff available to stop the siege towers, yep. you lost the game. <laughs> it's just oh, how I mean, it that, that like it's funny because that wasn't even the worst. That wasn't even the it worst. It's probably not even the worst. Close. No. I mean, I think no. that maybe the uh, the forty point carryover of uh, of Necker's with the old monster yeah. nest was pretty. It was pretty out there. That one was pretty hard to be okay with. But I mean, it's just one of them things, right? But like, it's. That I think just stands out for me, like the whole promote and the siege towers thing, and that yeah. kind of interaction or non-interaction for your opponent as soon as it gets made yeah, into gold. Once, yeah, you couldn't even you couldn't. It's not like now where you could scorch through immunity or you can, you can, was, you can uh, hit stuff. You can shackles, hit... right? Was it shackles used to? Shackles could stop one, but the thing was Henselt would put three on the board, and you can't yeah. stop them all. And then he promotes yeah. them, and then they just grow forever. And yeah. I won't even I won't even bore the audience explaining the mechanics because <laughs> all those cards were different. But uh, it was it was. I mean, in fact, it was so strong that in Challenger number one, Life Coach built his entire lineup around countering this uh, this strategy, and then he ended up not playing against it. Although it was in Challenger one, somebody brought it. Man, that seems like a long time ago. It was. It was May thirteenth, twenty seventeen. I remember because it's the day after my birthday, so I'll always remember that date very specifically. No, it was yeah. So yeah, card wise, like Voltas Pride in the in, in Homecoming is uh, exceptionally fun mm-hmm. when you get it to. Um, but it it's like most things that take a while to to get going right and uh, have very they're very uh, powerful. Is normally you can kind of see them coming or you can kind of expect them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you get it to work, it is, it is pretty cool. Um, from a card art standpoint, I mean, obviously, Wild Boar. Obviously. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. Swallow was always a really interesting one. I really liked the card art for Swallow. I yeah, think that was kind of... The potion, yeah. It's an old... That's yeah, like yeah, the... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the... that That's... I think both those potions saw art upgrades over time. But mm-hmm. yeah, the original just kind of glowing orange potion. Very Witcher. Very, very basic kind of... Which are yeah, give objects. A, give a shout out to Alex for that one because she uh, she did a fantastic job yeah. on that one. Yeah. I think that was more just because like that was one of the first ones I'd saw I'd seen from mm-hmm. from Gwent when I actually kind of researched the well, the online aspect mm-hmm. of it. I was like, oh, that's that's really cool artwork. Uh, and then the premium just where it bubbles is is really cool. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I I actually do like some of the premiums where they are sort of like still life at the same time. Like ointments premium is just very relaxing to look at, mm-hmm. like stuff like that. Um, now normally, uh, normally when I have guests on the podcast, I ask them to, you know, plug their channels and give shout outs. Now uh, you work at CDPR, but you have streamed, uh, you've streamed Gwent, uh, from time sure. to time. Um, what, what is that like for you? Uh, do people, do people come into your stream, like knowing, uh, knowing your involvement with the company? Like, what is it like when you actually, uh, stream Gwent and have you streamed Thronebreaker since it's been out? I've not streamed Thronebreaker. Mm-hmm. Um, one reason alone is I'm waiting to play it on console. Ah, I, yes. I bought a brand new TV, um, 4K TV. So I kind of, I have it on my GOG account um, mm-hmm. and I've played it many times. Of course, um, of course. As you can imagine, right? Seen it so, more than most people, um, I imagine. Yeah, I kind of want to take a bit of a break from from seeing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when, when the console release comes, I'm going to play on the uh, on the PS4 on my lovely 4K TV. Um, but less, yeah, less than to... two weeks at the time of this airing at this point, if we yeah, this would be yeah, on so, uh, November 22nd. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really coming up. It's really close now. Mm-hmm. 
So, um, oh, and, uh, there's... oh, yeah, the streaming thing. Um, yeah, I so mean, yeah, when I stream, it, I, think. I think people kind of people are inquisitive, right? So they they kind of I, I can't remember the last I, I streamed a while back. Um, I don't stream often, but mm. it's just kind of oh, I, I fancy streaming something, right? No, um, it's fun. Uh, and it's cool to chat with people, right? I understand. I totally understand why why you guys kind of do it. it. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's hard work as well. Like holy, holy shit! It's hard to do it every day. It is. Yeah. It's hard to do it every day for like long periods of time. At fr but when you start, it's easier because it's just like, oh, let's go, let's get it. Like it's just you, you're you're so pumped up, and especially if you see results early and. I remember I started right when Gwent, went, Gwent was taking off. So it was like really like it was electric for me because I hadn't streamed before. Um, but then, you know, you start building your whole schedule around it and it's it's hard sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, then then it becomes an actual job, right? It, it's mm -hmm. it's a thing. It's a big commitment, right? Um, but no, I mean, like people come into the chat and they'll say, oh, can you can you talk about this thing? Or can you talk about something that I have no idea about? Right. And it's like, <laughs> can we? can we balance this guys i don't know you have to go and ask the gameplay guys yeah. like, I, I have no saying that whatsoever um but yeah it's so like people ask questions and it's like no nah, i can't answer that one sorry um i wish i could and i wish i could tell you certain things mm -hmm. um especially when like Thronebreaker was was um still kind of in development mm -hmm. people have come on as like oh is it is it, like such a thing as i know there was like threads on reddit where people were kind of guessing the story um mm -hmm. And there was actually some, I can't remember what it, I, I responded to a comment. So if anyone wants to go through my Reddit history about responding, okay. um, there was actually a thread made. Uh, I've not checked up on it, but I'm very curious. I might do that later where someone actually goes, I think this is what's going to happen um, in, in Thronebreak story. And I think he got a couple of points. I remember reading it and going, uh, you're not too far from the truth there actually. So um, <laughs> good, good job to that person, whoever, whoever that was. Um, but yeah, it's cool though. It's cool. I like that the Witch World has so much creative territory in there, and uh, like a framework in which you can just kind of build up, build in. Because I know that this takes place before, uh, like uh, canonically, this takes place before mm -hmm. Witcher One starts. Uh, so there's just there's so much you can tell, kind of in this this space where things have only been hinted at in previous games to tell stories. Um, did you have to do? Did you have to do like some research on like what was mentioned in previous Witcher games to kind of do callbacks? Because there are some callbacks um, to the Witcher. Games. I mean, from like from the story standpoint and like the characters. Might have been that, might be more of a writing thing, I guess. But yeah, that's definitely a yeah. narrative thing. Yeah. Um, and the the guys that were working on on the narrative, like they worked on Witcher three, right? And they worked mm -hmm. on worked on the Witcher two, so. Mm -hmm. It, it's fantastic. I remember actually saying someone. Someone asked me about like kind of literally the same question of like like how much Witcher Lord do you know and and it's like well I know enough to get by. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I literally have two encyclopedias of knowledge sat right next to me. Where and they know pretty much everything about the Witcher universe. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever I would have a question, it's just ask them guys, right? Um, I mean, in all fairness, like they're not the only two. Like the people on the team, and mm. I could probably count a, a, another handful of people who were super, super into the Witcher lore. Not just from like a fan st standpoint, but just like super invested in, and, and know a lot about it um, because they worked on the previous games, mm. like Witcher One, Witcher Two, Witcher Three. Um, so yeah, I never really had trouble with the. Uh, uh, what does this mean? You know, they <laughs> just kind of know the deal. Uh, from the map standpoint, I mean. Uh, outside of one location on one map, okay. All the other maps, kind of, of like the locations you've never been to. Um, and well, no, all of them you've never been to, but right, right. Like, but like, there's already maps of these areas, so I guess you couldn't just put, uh, like you oh, know, you a mean giant like lake overall... where there might not be like sure. a giant lake. Let's say, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I've been the um. The actual locations and kind mm -hmm. of the the paths and that that Meve goes on, mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're, I mean, they're set in stone, right? The the, the world map mm -hmm. is a um, is a legit thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you can't just go put Lyria up near Kedwin, right? It, it just doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's got to go. Right. Um, Angren isn't located next to Art Skellig, right? It mm -hmm. just doesn't work. It's not a thing. Um, so there is definitely rules for that. But I mean, 
these maps are very much self-contained as like kind of areas that you explore. So we don't really need to worry about that too much. Again, because the narrative kind of leads the player on mm-hmm. uh, throughout the, the war effort. Sab, it's been fantastic for you to come on the podcast. Uh, Mate, it's been great it's, to uh, get to know you over the years, I can actually say at this point. Yeah, and, legitimately years, yeah. Yeah, it's been legitimately years at this point. So uh, to finally have you on is uh, is a real pleasure for me. And to have you on and to have uh, to have the support of, uh, of CD Projekt Red for episode 100 and to get these like really special exclusive interviews. Um, thanks to them and thanks to you for your time. Uh, doing it in the evening as well, off, off, off the clock and all that stuff. Um, I had to literally stop a gaming session for this McBeard. <laughs> oh, no, no. You make me feel even more guilty. It's no, like no, the it's worst cool, thing. It's honestly, dude, it's uh, like what you do with Commander's Horn. Uh, I know I'm a fan and I know a lot of the people in the studio are. Um, That's really cool so, to hear. Yeah. Um, no, you, you, you're doing fine work, sir. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is quite an honor to be on the, on the 100th episode. The hundredth episode, yeah, and the last episode. I'm stopping after this one. Yeah, there we are. Finish on a high. Mm, finish on a high. <laughs> <laughs>